Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Department of Transport uh, and Land or webinar on demanding higher standards infrastructure for active travel schemes. Um, we've got a record 600 and something delegates today, so thank you all for joining. Um, and uh, I'll let Kevin Goldin Williams kick off with the first session talking about gear change and the new um, guidance. Thank you very much, Adrian, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, absolutely huge turnout today um, for a really sort of interesting area, um, given the year that we've had. Um, I lead the cycling and walking policy team within DFT, uh, and no doubt you may have seen some of my colleagues, including Guy Bowlby and Richard Mace, speaking at various other events uh, that have taken place over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, most recently on Friday, uh, where there was a session which Guy was involved with, with all about engagement, which really is a, a very live topic at the moment. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So what a year we've had, um, uh, you know, this year when we started, if you think back to it, we were looking at potentially a spending review in the February, um, looking at a comprehensive spending review period over the next five years as well, um, and thinking about things like CWIS2. And then, of course, everything has changed with COVID-19. Um, now, for us, the big moment uh, was uh, actually started back in February. Some of you may remember a prime ministerial announcement about five billion pounds worth of investment going into buses and cycling and walking uh, back in February. Um, but then this was sort of followed um, once we were deep into lockdown when the Secretary of State um, made his uh, statement at the number 10 press briefing, which you'll recall were daily back back in the lockdown, where he announced over two billion pounds worth of funding for cycling and walking over the next five years. And of course, we know this makes sense. You know, we know increasing cycling and walking can tackle some of our most challenging issues in society, you know, whether that's improving air quality, combating climate change, improving health and well-being, or addressing inequalities. And one of the key bits of that announcement was the funding that was announced for this financial year. Um, so we had the £225 million that was announced through the Emergency Active Travel Fund, uh, which has come through in the true two tranches, uh, most recently, uh, the second tranche being a few weeks ago. And of course, we also had £25 million for the bike repair vouchers as well, uh, of which over 100,000 have now been distributed over the course of the two tranches. So a real landmark year uh, for active travel today already. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, at the same time as the announcement around the two billion pounds was made, we also uh, provided updated statutory guidance on providing more space for cycling and walking, from everything from pop-up cycle lanes to widening pavements, which was in direct response to where we were with the pandemic uh, back at that time uh, of the year. Um, since then, that guidance has been published once again, um, and some of the comments that were probably made and the discussions that happened last Friday around the importance of engagement um, with different stakeholders was was picked up in there, particularly around things like, you know, deliveries, um, considering emergency vehicles, um, and also working with different groups as well. But as I always say, this is a really dynamic environment. And of course, something that I don't think any of us have ever seen this sort of um, pandemic, if you like, or issue that we've been in, in our lifetimes. Uh, and as such, the response was sort of uh, marrying uh, that up. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, a few months after we announced the two billion pounds and the updated management guidance, uh, we published the Prime Minister's Cycling and Walking Plan, Gear Change. Um, and of course, the headline ambition of that is a future where half of all of our journeys and towns and cities uh, are walked by 2030. Um, and it covered sort of four main themes. 
uh, and, and I think this goes to the heart of cycling and walking really actually you know it, it's better streets for cycling than people it, it's about how we use and move around our local environments and, and what we feel comfortable with um, it's placing cycling and walking at the heart of decision making and, and, and I think there's a golden thread there which goes back to the publication of the cycling and walking investment strategy in 2017 you know statutory strategy for the first time ever outlining long-term funding into cycling and walking the next logical step is how do you get cycling and walking into the heart of decision making also the whole thing around empowering and encouraging local authorities which is all about enabling events like this as well um, and how we can make that leap into delivery over the course of decades really and then of course the final bit is, is enabling people to, to walk and cycle and protecting them uh, when they do, which is very much uh, what was driving us when we were developing uh, the new cycle infrastructure design guidance. But of course there are many things within gear change which links in with the new guidance. So whether that's delivering the thousands of miles of new cycling and walking routes, increasing the number of school streets, creating mini Hollands, improving the national cycle network, or just ensuring you know, that new housing and business developments are built around making cycling and walking the first choice for journeys. These all interact with and speak to uh, what the new cycle infrastructure design guidance is all about. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, um, this, this was a big announcement. Uh, the publication of the new cycle infrastructure design guidance, LTN 120 uh, in the end. Um, and, you know, uh, I just want to say a huge thanks now. Uh, I've said it lots, but I'll say it again, you know, to Phil and Adrian uh, and also Martin at WSP who kept us all, all on track. Um, it, it took a little bit longer than we probably expected, but, but we had a few things in the way. Uh, I think we had at least one general election uh we also had a minor issue of brexit and a global pandemic um so so challenges along the way but but we got it out in the end which was fantastic and, and i also want to say a huge thanks to the steering group as well which was made up of all sorts of practitioners from local authorities from disability groups everyone sort of had their say um, and the number of times we were all pitching in ideas uh, and Adrian and Phil and Martin brought a sort of clarity within those ideas and of course actually you know the, the wider community I mean the last time that this was updated was in 2008 and of course we knew it needed refreshing but actually it's sort of those communities of practice uh, and how actually design evolves over the decades which fed into the process, which led to the publication of this updated guidance. And of course, it's worth saying that, you know, we continue to keep the guidance under review. There's a huge list of actions within gear change, uh, which will influence how the guidance works over the coming years and over the coming decades as well. Um, and so that should always be at the heart of what we're doing, um, that reflecting practice, whether that's in a UK context or also in a global context as well. And certainly both UK practice and international practice influenced our thinking and our discussions as we developed the updated guidance. I think the final thing to say just on this is that it's always important to take the long view of this um, as I mentioned, we had the statutory cycling and walking investment strategy published in 2017. So for the first time ever, we outlined funding over the course of a five year spending review period. First time that's ever happened. And of course, when we get into our next spending, multi-year spending review period, we look to develop CWIS2, uh, which will once again outline the spending envelope for the next five years. Uh, and beyond that as well and of course one thing that informs everything is the local cycling and walking infrastructure plans because that's the thing that will make the difference locally and provide those pipelines of projects which will be delivered and which will enable us to hit our ambitions in, in gear change um, next slide please now this uh, next slide is around the summary principles uh, within the guidance that this rather nice little infographic actually was was designed 
for gear change, uh, which is quite nice. I'm not going to go into the details because uh, Adrian and Phil and the other speakers are going to go into the details around this. Um, but certainly we spent a lot of time thinking uh, around these design principles, the notions of segregations, the notion of making cycling infrastructure accessible for everyone uh, and of course some of those other changes the expectation that the guidance will be followed to receive funding um, and that cycling and walking is considered within local highway infrastructure schemes at the outset it's also a condition for any future government funding for new cycle infrastructure that is designed in a way which is consistent with the guidance uh, and I'll mention a little bit more how that works in a moment but it's also important to know when to break the principles and I think that's a really key one and I'll, hopefully you'll have some good discussions about this a bit later um, in those rare cases where it's absolutely unavoidable um, a short stretch of less good provision rather than jettison an entire route which is otherwise good would be appropriate but it's in most instances that's absolutely unavoidable and exceptions will be rare so it's really sort of challenging yourself to see what you can do locally uh, next slide please and as I mentioned, the two tools really that are driving this, one is the cycling level of service tool and the other is the junction assessment tool, which the cycling level of assessment tool, sorry, cycling level of service tool is a scoring assessment based on core design principles. Uh, it was something which was developed for the Welsh Active Travel Guidance uh, and has been working over there and implied in a, a number of contexts. The other side of it is the junction assessment tool which enables designers to assess how well a junction provides for cycling, looking at the movements in and around those areas. And I think it's just really important just to say that, you know, these two tools will really help to decide what design features are most appropriate for the routes that you're designing, but also how they fit into the networks as well. But I'm gonna leave that bit there because uh, Phil and Adrian know far more about it as do the other panelists than I do. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, and indeed there's been a Landor session only last Friday all about this, you know, engagement with communities is key. Um, everyone on this call, you know, you know your places best. Uh, you speak with your communities every single day. You probably live in your communities as well. Um, and some of the things that we've tried to bring out in the guidance are things like, you know, what is a case for change? Um, what's a vision for a place? Um, how do your proposals make life better for people living in those areas? Um, what's the difference that you're bringing, uh, that positive change? And the importance of a clarity of purpose. What, what is it that you're actually trying to achieve? What's the bigger picture for a place or a community that you're trying to bring? by any changes that you're proposing. And of course, the important thing is the building of trust uh, and creating that trust to explore ideas and debate and challenge uh, in order to develop those concepts into a concrete reality. Now, the final thing I just wanted to mention, because I think this really is something that will affect all of us, uh, that was uh, highlighted in Gear Change, is the creation of Active Travel England. Um, it, 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 at the moment, there's a lot of work going on at the moment in terms of understanding uh, its functions and its form. Um, but things that we do know um, is that it will have a role in scrutinizing scheme designs. Uh, it will be a repository of good practice advice. Um, and, and I think once again, going back to this idea of you know communities of practice and learning from what's worked and what hasn't worked, Active Travel England will have play a really important role in enabling those conversations to take place and to share ideas. Uh, it's also proposed that it be a statutory consultee within the planning system, which speaks to that earlier point about designing cycling and walking early on in the development of new um, housing developments and business developments uh, and making these places that people want to live and work in. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the form, the function and the funding required is all being developed now in conversations with ministers and others uh, and more information will be coming out of that in uh, in due course, as you'd naturally expect. So that's a sort of 
rapid sort of summary, really, I think, of where we've been. Uh, I think it's been a, a, a truly amazing year uh, from, act, from an active travel perspective. Uh, and I think really exciting years to come um, for us to sort of make long lasting change in those areas that we work with. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've had uh, a from uh, this, and please do, uh, if you want to uh, type in a question function on the uh, webinar. And our first question is from Stevie, and he says, How would you like Kensington and Chelsea remove a well death protected bike lane? Oh, so, sorry, Adrian, I missed some of that. I got the Kensington and Chelsea bit. <laughs> so, uh, Kensington and Chelsea have removed the pop-up bike lane from uh, along uh, the high street there. And um, the question is, how should we deal with that kind of uh, council that are maybe less willing to uh, do things than others? Yeah, it, it, it's a, it's an interesting one there. Obviously, with Kensington Chelsea and, and and their decision, and that they've they've made their decision for for reasons that that that, that they know. Um, I'm also aware that it's a very live issue because of the way that transport works in London, with the relationship with Transport for London as well. Um, so so no doubt we'll we'll, we'll see how that one develops. Um, I, I think you know thinking about where we're going in future. Um, with Active Travel England, and and I and I think where we'll be looking at in the future is this concept of where Active Travel England is looking at plans and proposals within future future funding bids, um, and working with local authorities to identify how they plan to deliver schemes. Um, where schemes are experimental in nature and obviously the world of experimental traffic orders and traffic regulation orders on a temporary basis um getting them to to justify why they're using that approach whether they're leaving schemes in long enough to actually provide solid monitoring and evaluation data in order to decide whether that permanent change is needed. And of course, you know, we've seen in places, you know, over the years, um, you know, with the Mini Hollands, where uh, different schemes have gone in, where, um, you know, school streets have been created, uh, or there's been um, some level of sort of modal filtering within an area as well. Um, and actually leaving that in for a su substantial time period to understand what the impact is of that change. Now, some impacts will be negative, so you have to consider how you um, deal with those, but also a whole number will be positive as well. And within that, you get contested spaces as well, people with different agendas as well. And that, that's why I always say, sort of it's about the engagement to understand actually what are the real sort of facts in the case, if you like. Excellent, thank you, Kevin. You've got another question um, from Salve. And it says there is an urban. Oh, sorry, reading the wrong one out here. Um, sorry, what? Um, yeah, sorry. And one of the key elements of gear change and LTN 120 is that the government can take back funding if schemes are not accord with the guidance. And um, now there's obviously a lot of schemes in the pipeline already developed prior to the guidance being released. So would funding be withdrawn at any point or is there a period? Yeah, I, I, I think certainly for those schemes that were being developed ahead of the guidance actually being, <laughs> being published, um, I think what we've said to those local authorities who have that is is be pragmatic around this uh depending on where you are within the delivery stage if you like um you know if, if you're still at the early design stage um there's opportunities there to factor in what we're saying within the new uh design guidance uh obviously if people are out constructing it it's 
it's too late uh, to, to, to be frank and uh, I, I think really it's just being about pragmatic around that certainly I, I'd say that you know moving forwards um, within that two billion pound envelope and what we will be proposing uh, for local authorities in the coming months and years there will be an assumption that this this will be adhered to um, and Active Travel England will play a role within that uh, and equally that isn't just necessarily about funds that are uh, specifically cycling and walking funds it's also around sort of broad uh, highway schemes um, but also other government funding sources uh, which are investing in local transport infrastructure as well um, and I think that's where Active Travel England will, will really have a, have a big part to play. Excellent, thank you. And one of the questions we've got down in uh, um, his question is uh, the LTN 120 is cycling guidance. Is walking halt on in terms of design guidance, and is are there any plans for walking guidance? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question, and 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 I think as everyone who sort of was involved in the development of the cycling infrastructure design guidance uh, will recall, um, uh, many a times if if I known that it was going to take this long to get it published, uh, I think I would have been tempted to uh, to include the walking element uh, to it. Um, and, and we know that's obviously the approach that, that took place in Wales um, as well. I, I think, to be honest, it's a discussion there, really, actually. Uh, we've got Active Travel England. Um, there, there could be, in terms of future guidance revision, bringing together uh, both cycling and walking infrastructure design guidance. Um, there's, there's pros and cons to that, as we saw with, with the Welsh guidance. Um, but also there is sort of work underway on things like Manual for Streets 3, which, you know, has a really big sort of implications for walking infrastructure. Um, so I think it's one of those, uh, it's it's an open question there, actually. Uh, and I think it will be one, particularly for Active Travel England, uh, to pick up in, in the coming years about how we treat the design of both cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure. Uh, I think it's also important to say that within the cycle infrastructure design guidance, you will see lots of references to walking because, of course, the two of them interact in so many ways. But of course, they're quite different uh, as well. And that's really important to remember. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, sorry to interrupt there. I was wondering if it would be possible if you could be able to locate a headset of some description because we're getting a lot of audio feedback from you um, just before your next talk. But um, please go ahead with ask this question, but just, just so you're aware. I'll go and grab a headset while I'm doing this question. Um, so this one is about the planning framework and uh, probably relates to the uh, active uh, travel panel um, and the current planning framework is not comfortable with LTN 120 so when and how will this be resolved? And while, you have, <laughs> while you do that Kevin I'm going to get my headset. <laughs> you, you go and get your headset and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in it'll be like a news anchor or something. Um, now it's, it's a really good question so obviously um, we had, uh, in terms of as a government, um, MHCLG uh, putting out a consultation earlier on this year. Uh, I believe they had something like over 27,000 responses uh, and, of course, various facets of what was being proposed reached all sorts of uh, conversations in the national media and social media as well. Um, I, I think there is going to be a need for more work following the publication of gear change to align what we're saying in the LTN, but also what we're going to be saying in future publications like Manual for Streets 3 um, as well. Um, MHCLG are very alert to what we're doing. They, they know what gear change says as well. Um, you would have seen the announcements last week around the um, national design guidance uh, and the design side of things as well. Um, and so I think it's going to be very much kind of ongoing discussions um, over the next few months and years about how we bring the, the vision within gear change into any reform 
of the planning framework, uh, which of course within itself will be uh, an extremely long process, uh, one would imagine. And Adrian, I see you've got your headset, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, there was just one comment as well from Dominic Smith, and I think you mentioned it in your presentation, Kevin, that we had a lot of input from uh, the Cycle Ambition Cities and from uh, various other local authorities and Transport for London into the guidance. So it was just to acknowledge really uh, thank you to all of those people who, who contributed to the guidance in some ways. Um, and then I think that is uh, all of the specific questions for Kevin. Uh, oh, one from Juliana, when will we know more about uh, how the Active Travel England um, board will work and, uh, and how soon it will come into operation? Uh, I, I, I could give a very dull civil servant answer, which is shortly. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I <laughs> but, but I've, I think the more realistic thing, and I mean, for, for all of the anyone that's ever been involved in trying to set up a new body, and of course, many of you have been involved in bodies in the past that previously existed, is that you know that there is a very strict cabinet office process for establishing any form. Uh, of new body uh, and I think actually you know for, for us and I know also for our minister Chris Heaton Harris um, he's really keen that that we spend the time to get it right um, and actually consider actually you know the form and the function of the new body um, how it's going to work that, that there's a whole bunch of new processes and systems that are need to be developed and of course but some of these are already operating in, in different ways but this is going to be on a national level um, so there's going to be a lot of time spent a lot of conversations about how things work also i would imagine we would probably see some testing of ideas as well um, and uh, I, I know a few of us are, are on this panel sit on the, the, the Department Cycling and Walking Infrastructure uh, Group and we're due to meet next week and we're going to be hearing some of the emerging ideas coming or, coming or from um, Laura who's, who's working on the Active Travel England project uh, around what that new body will look like and, and how it could work and kind of the group's views on that. So, so I think whilst you know it would be amazing to get it up and running as soon as possible, and I really do understand that. Equally, we have to take the time to really consider what do we want it to achieve, how do we want it to support what we're trying to do, you know, at the local level and the national level, um, and and what do those functions actually look like, um, and what can we learn from other bodies from across government and other countries as well. So. Um, yeah, soon, but um, lots of good ideas. And I think there's going to be lots of exciting conversations uh, over the coming year as well about what it's going to look like. Yeah, excellent. So we've had a couple more uh, DFT related questions in. Um, one is uh, any more detail on the timetabling of the sort of 2 billion funding announcement yet with any specific funds? Uh, so we had the uh, spending review uh, announced a few weeks ago um, from the Chancellor um, and in terms of the uh, cycling and walking side uh, we, we've had the announcement of what the funding will be in the first year um, so that will be for 21-22 and so once again we're doing work at the moment to understand how that process will work um how it will work with local authorities that have developed lswips um and also that interaction between the capital elements so the infrastructure and also the behavior change elements as well because of course at the moment we've got the access fund um and that's due to end in march next year march 2021 so we're, we're having lots of discussions at the moment uh within the team within, with the ministers uh as well uh and i would hope that in the new year uh we'll start coming out with some solid proposals obviously where we want to be um, is in the multi-year settlement area which 
fingers crossed, will be the case in the next spending review, COVID-19 permitting. Uh, and of course, once we're in that space, um, that's where the development of CWIS 2 will come into being. Um, but also, you know, we've heard about some new funding streams as well, such as the Leveling Up Fund, which is all about local transport infrastructure. So also, there's although we've only got a one-year settlement, actually it gives us some indications of where there may be future funding streams which will help with what we're achieving for cycling and walking. Thank you. Um, we've got one more question from Chris Watts and it's about the revenue implications of building new infrastructure. So there is a lot of capital money um, kicking around at the moment for building new shiny infrastructure but local authorities struggle with maintenance regular clearance of vegetation leaf litter other debris surface repairs etc etc um and it's often overlooked so um are there plans to help local authorities with more revenue funding as well in the future yeah i mean chris makes a really good point and 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 for me that's that's something that i'm very aware of uh, and within the team we're discussing that it's great that as you say you know we're, we're going to have you know the, the the shiny new you know uh, cycle and walking infrastructure but it needs to be maintained uh, and of course what we know about carriageway maintenance um is that you have to invest to save and so, you know, we're, we're having conversations uh, with our friends in, in local infrastructure uh, about how that works. And of course, as you see, uh, the dynamic of what we understand as the highway changing, um, you know, traditionally the carriageway, a cycleway and the footway. And actually, how do you take a kind of whole um, highway maintenance approach? And of course, once again, that will be something that will come out of gear change. Um, but it's a really, really important thing because the worst thing in the world is to put in really amazing infrastructure, but then not be able to maintain it, which means people won't use it, um, which means that despite behavior change, you know, interventions, um, you'll just get a reduction. That's, that's the worst thing that can happen. So maintenance is a really important thing. And also within the LTN, that was one of the guiding principles. That was a really key thing. I think everyone in the steering group felt that that was the case. So it's great to have new stuff. Everyone loves new stuff, but actually the maintenance of it once it's in is, is really, really critical to what we want to achieve. Yeah, and one final question, and I know that it came up uh, last week in our discussions is, uh, how should local authorities approach third party schemes, e.g. Network Rail or Highways England? Does it have to meet LTN 120 standards? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one, actually. And certainly I've been speaking with um, Highways England and HS2 as well um, about that sort of interaction between the local and the strategic network. Uh, and, and I think with most things in life, you know, the first thing is is having the conversation about what, what's what's a sensible approach here. Um, you know, what can be done together? Um, the worst thing in the world is to have a route, you know, which goes nowhere. Um, how does the interaction between the administrative boundaries work when you're trying to deliver a network approach? as identified in an LSWIP. And to be honest, that's kind of the purpose of the local cycling and walking infrastructure plans is so that you can actually have those conversations many years before actually you're constructing actual routes um, to explore sort of the art of the possible. Um, but certainly I think we're very clear that if we're talking about local highways, we're talking about this guidance, but I know that our, our friends over in both HS2 and Highways England and other sort of statutory undertakers as well um, are taking on board our guidance and bringing it into their processes as well. So as ever, I'd always just, just have the conversation, just talk. Thank you, Kevin. There have been quite a few other questions, but they are mainly related to design. So what I suggest is that we move on to the next session and introduce our panellists. Um, and they've all kind of brought along some hot topics to talk about that are happening within their areas. Um, and so we've got Dave Stevens from Transport for Greater Manchester, Chris Radley from um, Sussex County Council and Andy Salkald from Leicester um, City Council. 
and then myself and Phil Jones, who were involved in uh, development of the LTN. So I'm just going to uh, could I have the next slide, please. So we've just uh, got a few introductory slides to help to sort of uh, kick off the conversation. And uh, next one, please. So gear change sets out this challenge of a step change and an improvement in quality. So how do we go about uh, doing that? Next change, uh, next slide. And some of the common challenges that we encountered and particularly informed by the eight cycle ambition cities and transport for London, side roads was something that we definitely wanted to try and sort out within the guidance. So next slide, please. We've put in uh, some examples of uh, what we call marked priorities. So using the uh, traffic signs and road markings to um, indicate the priority and also design priority where the materials choice and, and the look of the thing indicates a priority. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, finally, moving on to uh, signalized junctions and I'll introduce um, Dave Stevens here who's going to talk about some of the innovative schemes that have been introduced in Manchester. You're on mute, I'm afraid, Dave. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm Dave Stevens. I'm project manager for transport for Greater Manchester, and uh, we've been dealing with those issues around side roads and around um, junctions on some of our CCAG2 schemes that were morphing into what we call in Manchester the Mayor's Challenge Fund, because we've got the uh, Andy Burnham is the Mayor of Greater Manchester. And we have some devolution and Chris Boardman as our walking and cycling commissioner. So um, we've already been going through the culture shock of the LTN 120 before it was even written. Um, and uh, what you can see there is a visualization of our first Cyclops junction. Now we've actually built this junction. I'll put a, a link to a video about it in, in the chat. Um, and this is this has been our solution to the problem of how to achieve Dutch style junctions when you don't have a Dutch legal context, you don't have the giveaway on turning rule, and you don't have presumed liability. So how do you get cyclists safely through the junction? And the reason we built this junction was because it had no existing pedestrian phase. So anything we built was better than existing. So that gave us a bit of scope for experimentation. And also there was no capacity problems at this junction because the junction above it and below it had capacity problems so there was a bit of scope to uh, experiment here uh, and also there was loads of space so actually what we've built with the advanced stop lines is we've built a conventional junction with traffic lights and a conventional pedestrian crossing and we also built the cyclops facility as well around the junction which is the orbital track around the outside of the junction and what that allows us to do is to see how cyclists react and we're measuring and monitoring this junction at in, in now on the ground uh, and most cyclists are using the uh, the orbital cycle track um, a few are choosing to stay on the carriageway and use the old style ASLs but most are using the, the, the track the big advantage we find is because cyclists going around the outside of the pedestrians we can run the pedestrian and cycle phase at the same time because the pedestrians are crossing the cycle track in the corners on a staggered crossing and then they're pushing a button also because the pedestrian phase is slightly shorter uh, it's less impact on the junction. So um, we've built one of these um, and uh, we're going to build build lots lots more of them. If I just flip to the next slide, we'll learn a bit about the, the how we got to this point. Uh, so this was a um, visit to a CCAG1, Cyclist so City Ambition Grant 1 uh, piece of infrastructure. This is the Wilmslow Road section of the Warburton Oxford Road, Wilmslow Road Cycleway, which tripled levels of cycling between the student village and the university. Um, but this is a, you can see me in the background with my hat on, uh, and a post implementation site review with the disability design reference group. And we're picking up here some issues that we designed into this floating puffin crossing. Um, because um, the L shaped uh, tactiles on the island, uh, the blind and sight sighted users on the pavement were struggling to find the start of the, of the crossing trail and also 
you can see there in the foreground, um, we've got some tactiles on a corner and that was confusing for, for, for like blind users and they weren't sure where they were supposed to be crossing. So we tried to design that out. Um, and if I go back a slide, can I go back a slide? Sorry. Yeah. Um, what we've done in the cycle design is, is it's, it's much simpler. Uh, it's in, in the corner. So you cross the cycle track and then you cross the junction as per normal. You push the button, you get the rotating cone on the, on, on, on the, on the lights and you, and you cross the carriageway as normal. And we've got a template that we can apply in, in lots of locations. So we really, now in, on the one we've built, uh, we've used informal crossing to cross to the islands. Uh, we, we do have the option to use zebra crossings across. And if you skip forward a slide, um, there is a note in LTN 120, uh, 10, paragraph 10.6.22, which I think is guidance, Phil. Phil will correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, but it's, um, and it's, it's about the fact that you shouldn't have cycle tracks and zebras and, and getting them confused. But the way we've done it in the cyclops, because there's a stagger, we think we comply with that fully. So we, 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 we think we're okay with that. Go on, Phil. So, so very quickly come in there. So yeah, that, that, that was a piece of guidance. I think there was there were concerns from DFT that there could be some confusion about uh, if, if visually impaired people had a, a priority crossing over the cycle track, which led directly to a signalised crossing of the carriageway. There was a concern that that might lead to some confusion. There are some authorities, uh, Adrian showed um, a photograph from Waltham Forest that, that does have the two crossings in line. It, it doesn't appear to be a problem. Um, but it was a concern, so hence the hence the the, the, the note in the guidance. But yeah, you 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 dealt with that, haven't you? Yeah, and if I go to the next slide, you'll see the uh, the cyclops that is currently under construction. Again, this is a visualization. This is on site at the moment. It is nearly finished, and this is in Bolton. And although in the foreground we've got an uncontrolled crossing of the carriageway, there are in the background three zebra crossings um, across the cycle track, uh, without Belisha beacons, without zigzags, uh, because they're just a crossing of the cycle track, not across the carriageway as per the update to TSRG in 2017. Um, so yeah, generally we've, this is quite a distorted uh, Cyclops ar arrangement because it's a very complicated location crossing the inner ring road outside the entrance of the railway station. Um, but we found the template of the orbital cycle track around the outside really flexible and really adaptable. Um, so we've got one built, which is one in Hume in Manchester. We've got two in contract, one that's on site in Bolton. Uh, the six out of tender in Salford, there was 13 in detailed design stages across GM and a further 19 or 20 in early stages of feasibility. And no other local authorities have expressed interest in the design as well. Um, so um, hopefully this is achieving those aspirations of, of our commissioner uh, and also of the uh, of gear change. Um, and hope this is a way to resolve many of those really challenging junctions where you've got you know, existing high levels of, of volume traffic and you really need clear segregation. So that's been our learning curve in Manchester at the Cyclops Junction. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Um, could I move on to the next slides, please? So we've got um, Chris Radley from Essex uh, County Council. Uh, next couple of slides, please. Um, I'll just put this slide in because we've been working in Harlow recently with Chris's team. And you can see that back in the 1950s, Harlow uh, had lots and lots of cycling, but nowadays, it, despite very good infrastructure for in a lot of places in terms of being fully segregated um doesn't always uh, live up to its kind of uh, cycle friendly reputation and how do we build on the extensions to harlow um and uh, ensure that uh, you know we get back to that high cycling mode share so chris do you want to fire away with your presentation thank you very much adrian um if we could skip to the next slide please uh, yeah, and skip, I think it's a couple. This one, stop here. Um, sorry, back one. Thank you. So yeah, so um, that's another image of Harlow. You might recognize that part, Adrian, just coming into the town. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for giving me the chance to, to come and talk to you today. Um, one of the challenges we face in, in Essex is, is urban extensions. Um, and it's a, it's a huge challenge that we, which we're sort of facing head on. Um, we currently have a population of 1.4 million people, um, we're home to 650,000 jobs. And we've got the eighth largest economy in the UK outside of London. 
and, and part of our ambitious growth plans, we're looking to uh, introduce 130,000 new homes and 80,000 new jobs over the new, next 15 years. Um, so as a result, we've had to kind of adopt a, a robust means to ensure that we're overcoming the challenges of urban extensions through active travel. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're actually setting quite ambitious mode share targets. Um, so Harlan, Gilston Garden Town, which is a, an urban extension of Harlow itself, we've set um, an average of 50% of all journeys are going to be made by sustainable modes across the town with 60% within the new settlements. So really ambitious targets. Um, we're also developing our LCWIT process in Harlow um, and that's working with, with Adrian and his team and we've looked at a network of sustainable transport corridors that reflects those LCWIPs. Now those corridors are going to provide high quality um, key networks for walking and cycling and public transport. Um, and we're using LTM 120 because it's, it's actually presented as quite a unique opportunity and, and Kevin mentioned earlier on about that kind of opportunity to audit or to go back and look at your legacy and pipeline schemes and, and the sustainable transport corridors have been kind of developed over the last couple of years but we'll use LTM 120 to go back and review those. Um, we're also um, promoting the use not just in Harlow but across all of our new developments and uh, garden communities across the county to use the Essex Design Guide. Now this is the UK's first interactive web-based design tool for, for developers and it's got active design principles at its core and what we're doing is making sure that now aligns to LTM 120 standards. Um, we've also got a cycle design portal um, and that's an online tool for our designers and engineers in-house to, to use to actually make sure that they're following the latest best practice. So Historically, it was referencing um, Sustrans design guidance and London cycle design standards. Since LTM 120 was launched, we've amended the portal because it's an online tool. So all our designers and engineers are now getting the latest um, best practice. Um, with regards to our urban extensions, the question we're often asking ourselves is what should they, our urban extensions look like? Um, we want to make sure that the designs have permeable layouts that, can, that are well connected. We want to consider healthy streets, make sure we have that whole street approach. Um, we want to make sure we prioritise our walking and cycling and public transport. We want to remove unnecessary traffic um, and we want to, to design for future adaption of those spaces to make sure that we can enable and accommodate any changes in the way we want to use our streets and transport in the future. And obviously that's picked up in LTM 120 and we're trying to make sure that we adopt that um, going forward. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Obviously, LTM 120 in, in a county like Essex is, is quite challenging for us because we are a, a sort of a very diverse county. 70% of the county is actually rural. So we've got this urban rural kind of um, challenge when it comes to what we're looking at from an infrastructure pers perspective. We've got ambitious plans in Essex. We've developed strategic, strategic plans for our cycling and walking network that pretty much cover the whole county. Um, and we aim to implement LTM 120 standards across those. However, Traditionally, they've always had a focus on, on urban areas. Um, and, and while the DFT focus is on urban areas, um, we're currently looking to make changes and improvements for rural travel and, and particularly around um, active travel. And we want to understand how we can connect those rural communities to key services using active modes. And that's a kind of big piece of work that we're going to look at going forward. And you know, it may be that we look at a rural local cycling and walking infrastructure plan so that we can make sure that we connect our rural communities to their, their key services. Um, and if we can, we want to identify you know, those trip attractors, those satellite villages and rural communities without basic services and link them to the trip attractors, or the railway stations, the high frequency bus services that we know exist and often bypass those rural communities. How can we link them to those and their local shops? Um, and then we'll be looking at how we do that you know, what does the infrastructure look like and and you know what will it, will it be new infrastructure will it be looking at ruralization public rights of way network quiet lanes um and that will help us start to encourage that modal shift so um you know that's that's where i am on my presentation i've got a couple of questions for for adrian and phil but i'm happy to hold on to those until the end and then i can sort of bring them back to you but thank you great thanks chris can we have the next slide please
Um, one of the uh, other challenges that we've uh, kind of had in the sort of questions prior to the session is uh, smaller villages and market towns and what kind of treatment. So uh, again, if anyone has uh, considerations for those environments, then uh, please fire your questions into the panel uh, in the next few minutes. Okay, next slide, please. And next slide. Okay, so Andy Salkalt is here from Leicester City Council. Um, and so, Andy, do you want to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Leicester, please? I think Andy, Andy might have dropped off, I think. Adrian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> I'll <laughs> tell you a bit about what's going on in Leicester then. Uh, could have the next slide and hopefully Andy will rejoin us for the thing. So uh, there are a couple of things that we wanted to emphasize about Leicester. One is that it has undergone this kind of extensive transformation of its central urban area with a mix of uh, improvements for walking and cycling throughout the kind of center of the um, city and also on all of uh, some of the principal approaches to that central area and um, in order to achieve that they've been very fortunate in having uh, good political leadership from the mayor and councillors um, and also good technical leadership so uh, Brian Deegan and Phil and uh, some other people contributed to uh, the design guidance for Leicester and Andy's back now so I'll let him uh, pick up on his slides. <laughs> uh, Andy are you there? Uh, I am I hope hopefully you can uh, hear me thanks thanks for that Adrian. Excellent right. I briefly got that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the story of Leicester is all about the, the political leadership, um, particularly in and around the, um, the the Connecting Leicester project, which is an economic regeneration um, story, um, which has been going on for the last eight years, effectively. Um, you can see some of the images on the screen of the kind of uh, quality of location that uh, has been created within the city centre, um, level surfaces, um, um, subtle guidance, um, for cyclists and pedestrians rather than kind of um, hardened segregation. Um, street trees, seating, um, kind of street furniture, um, road space reallocation um, on, the, on the surrounding streets. The, the, the scale of it, the context is just, uh, it's around about a 70 million pound project over the last eight years, connecting or refurbishing and creating eight public squares um, connecting that with around four kilometres of um, um, mostly, uh, well, traffic-free pedestrian priority streets, um, and then surrounding that with about another four kilometres of um, low-trafficked um, streets, but maintaining essential access for public transport, um, you know, essential people with accessibility needs and essential deliveries. Um, as you were saying, yeah, we've um, we worked with um, Brian Deegan and. Phil Jones Associates uh, uh, in particular around the Leicester Street design guide and um, they've, they've in anticipation of um, LTN 120 um, in part um, we've we've developed that street design guide with conversations with colleagues who've been implementing these physical um, changes on streets over, over the last um, um, de decade at least um, uh, in some cases some a lot longer <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, we've developed a street design guide, which um, LTN 120 is really welcome in that um, process. And it's, uh, it's, very, it's been very important for us to think about the technical um, issues that we've been faced in terms of kind of, um, you know, transition curbs and um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of water catchment and um, kind of, you know, issue, issues about the space evolution within the street scene. Um, and we will be reviewing the, uh, the the design guide in light of um, LTN 120 at this time next year. So there's a political commitment for that. Um, and um, seminars like this one uh, and the use of our own street design guide and LTN 120 are very much um, given to our project leaders, our project managers and design engineers uh, now as the template into which they should be um, should be designing. Um, going forward. So it's a really useful process um, in, in that sense. 
Um, we'll just move on to the next slide, please, the next image. Uh, th this is uh, this is an example of what um, Kevin was talking about, the evolution of streets and, and street scenes. Um, this is the De Montfort University campus. The, the top left image is from about 1938. The bottom, the bottom left image is um, when I moved to the city in the early 90s. Um, actually, a little bit after that, it's kind of like mid, mid, mid to late 90s. And uh, this, the image on the right hand side is what it looks like now. It's very much um, using street design principles um, and the, 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 the kind of issues which are and the design options which are included in LTN 120 um, and were predicted to be in LTN 120 um, to, to um, redesign the streets to make it um, a livable space for a 20, in this case, a 21st century university campus, which is more about farming students than it used to be about um, kind of um, farming textiles um, and, um, uh, and, and access to the canal, which you can see on the left hand side of the top image. Um, on, on the bigger image on the, on the right hand side of the page, that is still a public street. Um, it forms part of um, National Cycle Network Route um, 63 through the university um, campus. Um, it provides obviously full access for, for cyclists and, and pedestrians um, and it, it maintains essential access for emergency vehicles as well as introducing um, street, in, uh, uh, street seating, lighting, um, water catchment um, um, uh, facilities um, and, and maintaining that essential access but at the same time being creating a sense of, a sense of place on, on the university campus because it's um, it's a very important kind of economic asset for the university and for the city. Um, so that, that, that's just a, an example of, of, of the application of the kind of principles that are in LTN 120 um, are applied in the city. Just on the, if you take the next slide, please. So yeah, the just to bring you up to fully up to speed. So this is over the last um, six to uh, six to eight months um, since March we started implementing um, as part of our um, COVID-19 transport recovery plan um, we, we implemented 11 miles of um, road space reallocation to create um, cycle tracks um, and improved footways um, for pedestrians and cyclists um, primarily as a result um, or one of the results of our kind of uh, bike aid um, work which was very much around kind of providing access to bikes for essential workers to get to the hospitals uh, in particular and other essential services and in response to the kind of feedback that people were making almost immediately which was it's not safe to uh, ride down these particular streets even when there's virtually no traffic on them um, we, we were able to take the opportunity to kind of reallocate some of the road space and introduce uh, introduce some pop-up cycle lanes which uh, we're now going through the process of um, hardening and making permanent, so we hope to make them permanent after the uh, after the lengthy consultation process. Uh, we will be going through with uh, with active travel funds um, too, um, and we've added 30% of the city cycle network. Um, we've we've doubled the number of cyclists on these uh, on the routes in and around the city, uh, and and like the pedestrian priority um, work, we've we've. We've seen a significant increase in walking and cycling as a result of that work because it's it's got a level of quality. I think the final thing I'd like to, to say, I know you've, we've got to move on to questions, is if you look on the image on the top right hand side, there's one of our um, temporary cycle tracks put in with um, with with stick down ones uh, in this uh, in, in that scenario um, to prevent cars from um, parking uh, in a parking nearby that they used to uh, used to use. Um, in an echelon parking style, we put in parallel parking and we made space for a cycle track. Um, and the habits of drivers are very difficult to change, as you can see. People are insisting still on echelon parking, and because they don't want to be bumped from behind them, they, they end up knocking over some of the some of the ones. And then other service colleagues, uh, in this case the, um, the, 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 the the bin uh, the bin teams. Uh, basically, the refuse teams um, decide, you know, that the space that's been created because it's now safe. It probably, pro to be fair to them, probably wanting to defend some of the pedestrian space. Um, this, the, you know, this useful cycle track becomes a 
a place that the bins get parked. So it's, uh, I guess that's just an example of with the best technical um, know-how, you know, in the 21st century that we are now working with and with full political support, we still, we will still need to deal with the day-to-day -day reality of how we manage the kind of minor conflicts um, in and around the street space that we, um, that, that, that we change and use on a daily basis. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Um, so we've got half an hour um, left for sort of open questions and there's quite a lot that have come in. So I'll just pick off a few of the easy ones, first of all. So uh, what is CWIS uh, uh, was asked of Kevin and it's the Cycling and Walking Investment Strategy. It's just CWIS is the acronym. Um, there is an urban focus to uh, the LTN um, and it is very true that um, that you know we focus both in the local cycling walking infrastructure plan guidance and uh, in the LTN guidance on urban because that's where the most short trips are made but what does the panel suggest could be done in rural areas so I don't know if somebody wants to pick that up I'll pick that up I've been a fairly rural county. Um, yeah, we we face that similar challenge, and I sort of, as I mentioned in our present in the presentation, we're looking now to start to develop a strategic, a much more detailed strategic plan about our rural networks. Um, and one of the challenges we face is that LTN 120 sets out some quite sort of um, significant standards with regards to cycling infrastructure, and we know that our challenge is going to be around how we create that connectivity and if you're looking to meet the standards creating segregation is is a real challenge and you know will footway conversions in some of our rural areas where we've got low numbers be seen as meeting best practice and that's one of the questions we're kind of asking ourselves and obviously going to be asking uh, around LTM 120 but I think it's a big challenge for rural areas this idea of we know there's um, demand because we're getting those kind of that interest from our rural communities and we want to kind of meet that demand. But if you're looking to implement LTN 120 standards, the cost is going to be very significant and it's going to be very difficult in the future for us to potentially justify that cost. Um, and that's that's something that we're really interested in is how we might, um, are there departures from LTN that we could potentially apply in our rural areas? Yeah, I was just going to say. Okay. Um, on or I was, I was, I was on mute. Uh, I was gonna, don't have a lot of uh, rural areas in Manchester. I have a few in the Mersey Valley, but uh, certainly do in Wigan on the edge of Greater Manchester. Uh, and uh, there we are looking to use um, urban green spaces, um, uh, regeneration sites, so canal towpaths, tissues railway lines, um, the na nature reserves, and there we are using uh, those three metre shared use paths. Uh, because in those lower volume spaces, they're, they're appropriate. So a, a, a bridle way path uh, across a green belt to to connect um, Standish, which is to Wigan, it's a distance of about five miles, and then a disused railway line path through Standish itself, and that's sort of the hub of, of Standish to Wigan network. Um, yeah. So in the right setting, I think those standards and, and that shared use is, is appropriate. It's when that then gets applied as used to previously happen, gets applied in a setting where you've got a contested street space. It doesn't doesn't work so well. But in between space, in between places, uh, I think that that's okay. Yeah, and I think one of our challenges in Essex is that we've got, um, you know, rural communities, satellite villages, and the only kind of physical connection in theory is a is a national speed limit highway. Yeah. And it's, it's what do you do to create that segregation because it's 60 miles per hour and we know we want to segregate, segregate the cyclists and when you apply LTM 120 standards you know, you're potentially talking two or three miles to connect and the costs are, are very significant. Yeah excellent thank you um, and a number of people have commented on that we've got an all white male panel and um, Julia has pointed out that we did try to get more diversity but people weren't available uh, everyone's quite busy at the moment so uh, uh, we, we were the people who stepped up and volunteered I'm afraid um, so Simon Monk has been uh, uh, he's made a number of points that uh, London pioneered a lot of the things and a lot of the examples that are in the LTN are from London and yes we uh, did involve uh, 
TFL staff and Brian Deegan in the writing of uh, of uh, the guidance and uh, yeah we're very much uh, indebted to uh, London uh, TFL and the London boroughs for some of the pioneering work that they've done um, and then uh, sorry let me just scroll down to um, All right. So one question that's come up from a number of people, uh, including Simon, is uh, we, when we do these trial schemes, um, you know, we've seen things have gone in um, in Brighton and elsewhere and been taken out within a couple of weeks. And uh, we know from Waltham Forest that uh, there was a huge amount of opposition um, when the mini Holland things were put in, but uh, it was kept in for a while um, and opposition slowly died down over sort of six weeks. Um, uh, and eventually, as the permanent schemes have gone in, it's kind of gone all together. Nobody would want to go back to how it was. So uh, how is there a minimum and should DFT be recommending a minimum period for trial schemes? And if anyone wants to pick that one up. I'm happy to speak on it, Adrian, but yeah. uh, it, 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 it's, this is not an issue that we're faced with um, primarily in, in Leicester. We've not seen a lot of opposition um, to um, to the schemes that we've introduced. I mean, there have been anecdotal and minor kind of issues in some locations, but we're not seeing the kind of concerted campaigns or the public campaigns that I think um, it are talked about, which which do seem to be predominantly some of uh, London specific in, in a lot of senses. It does make a lot of sense for um, experimental schemes to at least see out the experimental period for which they are funded and which they are prescribed. Um, it, 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 would ma it makes no sense to introduce and spend public money to provide utility facilities um uh, to have them taken out in in what is what seems to be kind of quite a whimsical fashion sometimes i appreciate that dft is uh struggles with that and it's you know like all of us we work for political politically led organizations and we have to be responsive to the kind of the civic uh you know the civic life um but it does seem to be that there is um there's a process for implementation which we all have to follow uh, and less of a process for removal, unfortunately. So I would advise the DFT to stick to its guns. Yeah. Um, uh, and on a kind of related note, um, uh, and it's something that, uh, again, we encounter a lot, that um, officers will sometimes uh, recommend a scheme and then residents will oppose it. And depending on where we are in the political cycle, um, councillors will either kind of stick to their guns or they may uh, cave into the residents um, because they don't want to lose the vote. So is there a, does anybody think there is a good way of dealing with that situation? Uh, Chris, you put your hand yeah, up. Yeah, um, so with, if we're sort of talking specifically about um, emergency active travel fund as an example, in the phase one element, we we kept a kind of buffer for it was almost like a snagging element because we knew there would be a lot of comments and, and criticisms coming back from the public. So we were able to go out and sort of um, address some of the issues that they raised. Um, but one one big sort of lesson learned was is, is back to consultation and and through into sort of developing our bid and and sort of putting our schemes together for phase two. We've we've set up a really strong governance and part of that is steering groups. So each scheme has a very local focus steering group who are part of even uh, the design process so we encourage them to be part of the consultation part of the design process um, and they'll kind of allow us to hopefully develop schemes that won't face huge opposition when they're actually implemented yeah yeah uh, and I think that's something that uh, we've learned with some of the cycle ambition schemes as well. That kind of co-design is one of the ways to uh, um, to encourage encourage participation of local residents and to make them take ownership of the scheme rather than just opposing it. So, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, moving on to Cyclops Junction. So. John Nicholl from Warrington has asked a question, can we have a Cyclops without 
uh, segregated cycle lanes on the approach. Um, there are two sites in Warrington that uh, we've suggested to him that they might want to have put Cyclops junctions in. Um, yeah, we're looking at uh, one of those in Wigan at the moment, uh, where we're looking to go from a 20 mile an hour street uh, across a busy road into another 20 mile an hour street. Uh, and so having a using a Cyclops junction as, as rather than a crossing, because we want to keep the road open for traffic. Um, so yeah, the tie-in gets complicated, um, and how you get into the in, into the segregation and how you manage that. But yes, we're certainly looking at uh, options for that. Um, we haven't done, haven't got one, got, haven't got there yet, but that is a is a, is, a, is one of our one of our 19 that's in detailed design. We're looking at those options. Um, um, and then there's a second question, um, which is probably impossible to answer, but um, uh, what were some of the costs for the uh, Manchester junctions that you've shown? Um, yeah, um, we do have actual costs for the one we've built, but it's not a very good um, benchmark because it had so much development in it and it was so experimental. Um, so it's not a, a good case study. They do cost more than a standard junction. You've got more curbs, you've got more lights, uh, you've got more ducting. So they do cost about 20 25% more than a standard junction. Um, but that's just the nature of, of providing segregated cycle facilities. Um, but the actual outturn costs of the Hume one are not are not a good benchmark because it was so um, had such a long lead in time to it. It took us, you know, it took over a year to figure out how to do it. Uh, whereas now we just go, oh, the cyclops there. The design process is a lot quicker. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I just. Uh... And Tim asked um, about the advanced stop lines at the Cyclops as well, because now you've got some with and some without. Uh, what, what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah, um, on all of them, we are trying to design in the option that you remain on the carriageway. Uh, because we know that experienced cyclists often complain that they feel that they're being held up, uh, waiting for the ped for, for the green man phase, the green man and green bike phase. Uh, whereas if they were trying to carry it, maybe three junction right now, and some cyclists prepared to mix with the traffic. So we're trying to you know, always build in a, a merge point where cyclists can leave the segregation and rejoin the traffic if they want to. But based upon the anecdotal uh, uh, evidence that we've got so far on the Hume Cyclops. Um, we are more confident about providing uh, cyclops without ASLs in future because most people are using the segregation to go straight on to turn left or to turn right. Um, uh, so it was done deliberately like that so we could see really on the, on the test one because you know if we'd have we know for example on the you know, I remember there was a junction on the Leeds Bradford cycle superhighway part of CCA G1 where um, cyclists are in protection but they have to wait ages before they get their turn. And yeah. lots of negative feedback about that. So it was it, the Hume one that we built first lent itself to building both, and, and to see what cyclists actually did. Whether they use the SLs or whether they use the use the facilities, um, sub the Cyclops facility, and, and does it work as well in practice as it did in theory? And so far, it does seem to be be that. So definitely the Bolton one doesn't have ASLs, and most of the Salford ones don't have ASLs that are coming next. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, and we do see that as well with hold the left turn type arrangements where some people, you know, if you're kind of in the now, you realise you can stay on the carriageway and get through a bit quicker, but the people who want the protection have got the option then to use the hold the left turn lane. Um, one, another question from John Nickel, which I'll quickly answer about HS2. Um, so HS2 have adopted LTN 208 as a kind of default standard, um, but there are negotiations under progress at the moment with the HS2 team to get them to uh, up their game and uh, work with LTN 120. So, uh, so hold this space and no doubt, uh, I know DFT are putting a bit more pressure on them now to do that. Um, and then another question about uh, the potential timetable for the walking guidance. Uh, again, um, the cycling and walking infrastructure group at DFT 
meets sort of fairly regularly and uh, that is one of the things on the agenda for the coming year so hopefully they'll be in a position to have funding to be able to commission that piece of work um there's something on um bike parking and uh so can you elucidate on the copy topic of the need for effective cycle parking um obviously docked bike hire schemes provide their own but for privately owned um bicycles what types and coverage of cycle parking are expected to be needed and uh, i think you know with more people using e-bikes as well that kind of raises the standard a little bit because you're not going to ever leave your e-bike uh, probably open in the street so uh, what what are people doing on cycle parking if anyone wants to pick that one up i'm happy to start yeah, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, we are all one. One our first process that we started doing is actually auditing our existing cycle parking network. We realised that there was a gap in our knowledge and that we didn't really fully understand. We still don't necessarily, but we didn't fully understand where all our cycle parking existing. So we've done um, a kind of audit and then put together a strategy, particularly in in Chelmsford, around where cycle parking could and should go. We've identified uh, opportunities within the highway uh, network that we could introduce more cycle parking. Um, and for some of our strategic corridors, so when we're looking at um, our EATF routes and our LC whips, what we started to do is identify kind of transformational corridors. And within that, we're starting to look at things like cycle hangers and working with local communities to sort of say that actually, you know, we'll provide you with the um, facilities at the start of your journey and then we're working with for example in Chelmsford for your end journey to make sure we've got the, the suit of, got suitable cycling, cycle parking facilities at both start and end of the journey. Um, it's a big piece of work there's more to be done um, but we we see that as something that we're, we're kind of looking to develop and we're also um, just going into conversations around the Essex parking standards so we're making sure there's an element within that that specifically states what ratios we're looking at in new developments and um, across all our different kind of um, trip attractors to make sure we're delivering and making sure we're providing suitable levels of cycle parking. So in the future, we should see uh, significant changes. Thanks, Chris. Uh, any, uh, Andy? Yeah, hi. Yeah, we, um, as part of our Transforming Cities Fund budget, this, the city, it, the Leicester's looking at um, four cycle hubs which are high capacity high security in places like the um the, the bus stations one next to the um the leicester royal infirmary hospital um a couple of a couple of others near a major retail site um, uh, within the city um we have an existing high capacity town hall bike park which is effectively in the basement of the, of the town hall and then the railway station and both universities have already got existing cycle hubs and they, they provide for um, higher levels of security. Um, th there will be um, um, some charging points for, for electric bikes in some of them. Um, and uh, on top of that, there is there's a small program of um, kind of on-street cycle parking provision um, and also a development, working with developers for both um, residents in particular or, or workforce and then visitor parking around new developments in the city are so some of the solutions to, um, to to the cycle park in question um bike share is the is, is probably the big growth area for us within the city because it it, it fulfills the need takes away the security risks um, and kind of provides at scale um, the opportunity to kind of deal with the theft prevention which is the kind of key issue really around cycle cycle parking in a city like ours yeah, Th thanks, Andy. Um, there was a question about uh, the use of the um, the kind of toolkit. So uh, the uh, um, level of service tool to kind of score schemes as one of the kind of entries to funding. Uh, how do people feel about that in practice, that this idea that Active Travel England might be able to come along and assess your scheme and say, uh, oh, this design doesn't meet the standards for funding? Uh, 
uh, as practitioners, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I can, I can uh, probably, probably start on that. It, 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 it's good for other people, but not for us. You know, we wanted to, we wanted to apply it across the board, but but we don't want it to constrain our options to um, to to make choices which, you know, could lose us funding. Um, the, the example of um, segregation along routes, which um, Chris and Dave were talking about in rural areas, it is relevant to a city like Leicester, and, and there's a contentious conversation. Um, you know, go, going on at the moment over some, some of the routes within the city, which within which we expect uh, moderate, uh, low to moderate kind of um, cycle use. And the question is, and it's a good question, what, you know, why should we pay a significant um, cost um, for um, for a piece of infrastructure which won't evolve over you know, use over a short period of time um, when we could reasonably be providing a a moderate but but adequate level um, for for people, and, and it's kind of that incremental kind of growth question. Um, it, nobody nobody wants um, Ofsted, you know, a, a transport kind of Ofsted um, environment, um, because all of us are busy trying to implement in an environment which is technically short of resources and technically short of of, of, of capital um, and and revenue to kind of like to, to make the changes we all want to achieve. We don't want to feel that we're going to be whipped in the line by some sort of often offstead inspectors, um, you know, stepping into the local authority breach. Um, yeah. But but equally, I think everyone agrees that we need a quality improvement and a step change for what it is we're trying to, to achieve. We do need a 21st century kind of um, move in the right direction, um, and we don't get that without quality controls of some to some degree. Yeah, and I, I think as long as standards are applied sensibly rather than in a tick boxy approach, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, we we had a a, a design that came in early days, and it was like, well, it, it meets the minimum standards, yeah, but we're right in the middle of, of 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 a city here. Minimum standards aren't aren't enough. We we need to be above minimum standards here. And then similarly on a scheme in Wigan, it was kind of like well, it doesn't really meet minimum standards, but it is on a canal towpath on the edge of Astley. How busy is it going to get? You know, is it worth arguing over 40 centimetres of, of, of path, or do we, we should be sensible here and let the anglers sit there because they're going to sit there anyway? So as long as you apply those standards appropriately in the in the correct context, I think it it, it will be fine. If it becomes too tick boxy and you know it has to be this and it has to be that, then that's in no one's interest. But if it's applied sensibly, I think that'll work well. Excellent, thanks. Um, there's one question that's come in from a number of people in various guises so uh, where you've got a two-tier authority where the um, county is the highway authority but the district might be the planning authority and also where you've got the kind of uh, combined authorities or metropolitan county type authorities um, how uh, well do you think uh, that the standards can be applied um, in in the decision making because we, we've got some authorities taking the view that uh, it wouldn't apply to developer funded schemes but it would apply to sort of things that were directly funded by the DFT so how are you kind of handling that within your own organizations shall I start from a two-tier authority <laughs> perspective um, yeah so it, I think since DLTN 120 come out and, and gear change, it's made uh, our district and borough colleagues think differently. Um, and we're in conversations with with a number of our of, of, of our colleagues in the districts and boroughs, focusing on things like their strategic plans. How can they develop LC whips themselves for their their local networks? But also, can they start to and they're starting to look at developing their own cycling strategies. So a tier below us, but having their own cycling strategies. And I think. You know, with that in mind, we will be able, we're going to work with them. We'll be able to guide them, and and obviously part of that is going to be looking at this kind of quality and standard of the networks they develop. So the adoption of LTN 120 will be something that we can encourage and and persuade them to follow, and that will then become adopted at that second level. So we don't want to be the upper tier authority sort of informing and telling local authorities what they should be doing, but this process will allow them to take that step themselves. Yeah. Um, Andy, do you want to add to that at all? 
Not See you in the <laughs> and Dave? Um, yeah, it's a similar thing. We, you know, uh, Greater TFGM work on behalf of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, um, and we're trying to make sure that you know what what works in Stockport also works in Manchester and works in Bolton. But obviously, you've got to bear in mind the the, the context of you know Rochdale is is a, is a very different place to Wigan. Uh, so um, you know, you, having having that uh, central cross boundary uh, thing adds value. As long as it adds value, everybody's happy. When it's just a bureaucratic extra hoop to jump through, it's in nobody's interest. So as long as we're adding value, I think we're we're appreciated. Yep, excellent. Thank you. Uh, um, there's been a couple of questions about the safety of uh, the cyclops from the point of view of uh, blind and partially sighted people. Uh, did you do much engagement about that, Dave? Yeah, um, so uh, we involved uh, blind and partially sighted in the development of it. We went out and looked at what we built on part of CCAG1, part of our first wave of, of infrastructure. Uh, and we, uh, I showed a slide of, of that earlier. Uh, we also produced a 3D tactile model of the, of the first cyclops. So you could trace your finger around and feel that where the cycle route went and feel where the pedestrian route went and feel where the cars went so you get get a, get a sense for it. One of the things that um, people liked about it uh, was that it was a template and we could use it in lots of different contexts. So over time, all the junctions of Greater Manchester will probably comply, obviously there'll be some exceptions, but more or less comply to that to that, that, that structure. Uh, they like that and that, that continuity. Uh, there's always a concern when you add a cycle route in uh, if you segregate walking routes and cycling routes, which most people most people like, most walkers like that, most cyclists like that, most blind and party sighted users groups like that, what do you do when those desire lines cross and how do you cross a cycle track? Um, some people would prefer a full signalised uh, crossing of a cycle track. We have one of those on the Oxford Road cycle route, but the compliance is very bad. Most pedestrians don't push the button. Um, they just gap seek across the, um, across the cycle track. So most cyclists don't look at the traffic lights; they look at look at the walker, and 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 work out what the walker's going to do. So when somebody does push the button and stands and waits for the green man, the cyclists don't think they're going to cross. They think they're checking their phone or waiting for a friend because they're not looking like they're about to cross. And all of a sudden, the light goes red, the man goes green, the walker steps out, and then there's actually creates conflict. So we weren't very keen to go for the push button. Uh, crossing a problem at an expense and, and clutter. Uh, on one example of that, the compliance isn't isn't good. Um, we have we have lots of zebra crossings across cycle tracks at bus stops. Um, they work okay. Some detail issues, particularly where we've got one that's obscured by a bus shelter, and we've also got uh, one that's by the eye hospital that doesn't work particularly well because people who arrive by bus. It might leave the hospital with a diagnosis of being partially sighted, but it might arrive at the hospital without a diagnosis of being partially sighted. I mean, in an unfamiliar space with a degenerative eye condition, so that's maybe not that's maybe not working well. So there's there's less, definite stuff to to improve there. We are looking at an audible device to try and improve that. Um, but yeah, there's there is no easy solution. If you're going to add in cycle infrastructure, uh, you've got something else to cross. You want a pavement, you want to get to the next pavement. You've got to cross the cycle track and then cross the road. Um, yep. So yeah, there is yep. there is no There's perfect solution. A layer yep. of complication. Yeah. Yep. Um, and did did you have anything to add about Leicester's experience? Because um, again, you've got quite an extensive network now. Uh, I, yeah, I think I think those kind of issues of kind of managing um, pedestrians and cyclists are very common with our pedestrian zone um, issue. The the removal of traffic signals, which has happened in Leicester, because we've um, we've reduced vehicle movements and we've 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 created streets now, which um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would have required traffic signalling um, and now don't because we've 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 changed the balance of the mode share. That has led to um, to, to to challenges being made that that some street users feel more now feel more vulnerable. And, and the behaviour is uh, changing. I think that is part of the, um, the the what needs to be managed continually 
on an on, on an ongoing basis, even in an environment within which we're significantly reducing um, vehicles and we're significantly increasing pedestrians and cyclists and other forms of, of road users, particularly particularly you know the fivefold increase in people who were self-identified with disabilities within the city went up in the pedestrian. You know, those numbers increased fivefold in the pedestrian zone. Um, that means that there's potentially you know conflicts which weren't there previously that we do have to manage uh, all i can do is agree really with with dave and the evidence in leicester is um we, there are things that we have to manage on an ongoing basis we don't we don't deal with any more complaints and issues now even though we've well, quadrupled the number of cyclists and doubled the number of pedestrians over the last 10 to 15 years we're still the city mayor says we're still dealing with the same level of complaint that we had 15 years ago. Now, exponentially, that's a big improvement, but in reality, the same number of people are still un unhappy with uh, with with the situation. That's just something we've got to deal with. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Andy. Uh, uh, did you have anything to add, Chris? Or not on that matter? No. 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 Okay. Um, we are just about at the end of time now. Um, so. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their uh, contributions. Uh, thank you for all your questions. And I'm really sorry we didn't get through all of them, but there were lots and lots, as you can imagine, with uh, over 300 people on the call and 500 people registered, some of whom have dropped out. So uh, the, there were literally lots and lots of questions coming in. So I was trying to group them into things that were common um, so, so that, uh, you know, most people's uh, main topics got covered. Um, so uh, just thank uh, Landor, thank Kevin from the DFT uh, for his contribution and um, I'll hand you back. So thank you very much.